And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Hi, this is Donna Lauren. Welcome back to Love's a Secret Weapon. And today we delve into my experiences on the Milton Berle Show. Mr. TV's return to that medium in 1966, this time on ABC TV. His new variety hour was filmed at the spectacular Hollywood Palace and featured appearances from Steve, Allen, Jane Meadows, Bob, Hope, Phyllis Diller, and Lucille Ball, just to name a few, even Adam West. To bridge the generation gap between Mr. Burl's vaudeville and the mod generation, and of course to provide the music, Bobby Rydell and I were cast as regulars. Hey, Adam. How are you, dear? Good um, afternoon. I'm doing well, Donna. It's good to be back. Oh, definitely. Always great to reunite with you, honey, from down below and up <laughs> above. and <laughs> Everywhere in between. Yes, all over the galaxies. So I heard you do a bit of research on Bobby, and so take it away. Absolutely. Well, speaking of Bobby Rydell, in the 60s, the teen idols didn't come much bigger than him. Like yourself, Donna, Bobby started performing young. His father would take him around the clubs of South Philly and ask the owners if Bobby could sing some songs and do his imitations of other singers and actors. In 1952, Bobby auditioned for a local kids' talent show, Paul Whiteman's TV Teen. With a song and imitation of Sammy Davis Jr., doing imitations of people like James Cagney and Jerry Lewis, Bobby won the talent show and a contract. Signing with Cameo Records in the late 50s, Bobby amassed a string of hits including Wild One, Swinging School, We Got Love, and Volare. I love that last one. That's at every Italian wedding I've ever been to. <laughs> I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> and of, of course, as we know, Philadelphia was the home in those days of American Bandstand with Dick Clark. And Bobby appeared on that show multiple times, as well as doing a couple of Dick Clark's Caravan of Stars tours. And we remember your experiences, Donna, on one of those in 1964 with Gene Pitney and the Supremes. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Unforgettable. Yeah. And speaking of touring, Bobby was a busy guy in the 60s and continued to be. He toured my home country, Australia, I think more than 20 times over the years. And of course, we know that Bobby branched out also into films. He appeared opposite Anne Margaret in the unforgettable Bye Bye Birdie. Oh, one of my faves. <laughs> Mine too. And Bobby laid a sign with Capitol Records and Reprise Records, same as you again. So there's some more crossover there. And, you know, into the 80s, manager Dick Fox had an idea for a show with Bobby and fellow Philly teen idols, Frankie Avalon and Fabian. Well, the Golden Boys started in 1985 and are still going in 2021. Amazing. Yeah, and of course, those of our listeners who know the Beach Party movies well know, of course, your connection to Frankie Avalon. And Bobby, as many of his fans are aware, faced a life or death emergency in 2012 when he underwent a 20-hour kidney and liver transplant, saved by the selfless act of an organ donor, a young lady named Julia. And I would encourage you all, after my own recent family matter, to become an organ donor if you can. But... Healthy again and now married to Linda, 
Bobby continues to tour, and in 2016, he published his very readable autobiography, Bobby Rydell, Teen Idol on the Rocks, A Tale of Second Chances. I really like that idea of second chances. So I love that too, especially in these times. Yes, and how that leads in quite well. How are you today, Donna? Oh, well, <laughs> adjusting. <laughs> what can I say? Mm. Is anyone well adjusted? I don't know. We are in an amazing transitional time. I keep saying it and it just keeps reminding me of just probably hourly, you know, Um, but essentially I think um, life is finding a center Mm -hmm. and um, I'm finding some sort of equilibrium in all the changes that are happening and um, no complaints here. Awesome. That's awesome to hear. We were we were talking before we actually started the episode. So we were talking, you know, when we first touched base this morning, my time, and this afternoon, your time in preparation to record that we were just talking about, you know, sweet treats and baking and all these wonderful <laughs> <laughs> things that you have been tasting some new treats um, around the uh, the shops in the neighborhood of your new home. And I've been baking. I, I had a bucket of persimmons uh that were ripe and ready to go and I thought what am I going to do with a bucket of persimmons so I made a, a persimmon bundt cake which was absolutely delicious with um, oh, yummy. yeah cloves and cinnamon and all spice and walnuts and and all sorts of things and you were suggesting I should put a shot of espresso in it next time just just get just put the put the coffee up mm. I'll be there <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fantastic. And and for our because I I love having this chat and we we're also having a chat of course with our listeners who who have been, you know, so kind and and um in giving us their feedback on on social media and in email and and just to remind everyone that you can continue to do that at podcast at net. but if we remind our listeners where we were the last time we spoke we had started our chapter 11 blowing out the candles and in that chapter you talk about moving out of your parents house at 19 and getting a new beautiful corvette but you also had to undergo an emergency surgery at that time And shortly after that surgery, while you were resting up, uh, you pretty soon had to report to a new TV show, The Milton Belt Show. Yes, indeed. You know, the Mm. show must go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knew that better, that's definitely Uncle Milty. You know, he was uh, probably born in a suitcase, as they say, about Borderville (laughs) and and then did it for the next however many decades. Yeah, somebody found the key and let him out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Love it. And, and then he made the copy so no one would could t- take it away from him. <laughs> I think that's perfectly said. Um, <laughs> so we're going to start with a little reading from the chapter about your experiences on Milton Bell. And our listeners might be wondering, because we didn't actually say why we did such an intro into Bobby Rydell, because we, of course, have a interview or a conversation between yourself and Bobby Rydell reunited after many years. Very graciously, yes. He, of course, you know, many, many, many people who have been kind of in lockdown with the pandemic um, have taken the opportunity to Mm. communicate from their living rooms or wherever Mm -hmm. they are. And, um, And this was one occasion I had to reunite with Bobby. Well, that's where we're looking forward. And I know our listeners will really look forward to hearing that interview. But before we do that, we're going to delve back into 1966 and your memories of the Milton Bell Show. Are you ready to take it away? Indeed. Continuing on with Chapter 11, Blowing Out the Candles. Turning back the clock, (laughs) only, only three weeks after my trauma, I was to report to the Milton Burl Show. Joy, joy, you got a lot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce this time a very. What's that, right in the show, middle of the phone? <laughs> what, what is it? A phone call? Telephone for you, Mr. Burrow. Thank you, but you shouldn't be on camera. Why not? You're getting away with it. I was. <laughs> really? You will see him next week. Hello? <laughs> Who is this? Oh, Donna Lauren, the beautiful young singing star with all the hit records. <laughs> Honey, it's a good thing you called, because you're on. Yes, you're on. If you're feeling sad and lonely, 
There's a service I can render. Tell the one who loves you only. I can be so warm and tender. Call me. Don't be afraid. You can call me. Maybe it's late, but just call me. Tell me and I'll be around. And when it seems your friends desert you, there's somebody thinking of you. I'm the one who Don't forget me, cause if you let me, I will always stay by you. You've got to trust me, that's how it must be. There's so much that I can do. Have you heard of poor, poor Donna? Blitz her heart and she's a goner. So did Laura, and how she shows it. And she thinks that no one knows it. Don't breathe a word of it. Shh, shh. Nobody's heard of it. Shh, shh. Promise you won't tell us so. When he's near, she's acting foolish. And she just can't play it coolish. She's way out and all a flutter. And her heart just melts like butter. Shh, shh. Don't breathe a word of it. Shh. Nobody's heard of it. <laughs> Promise you won't tell us so. I've got a secret. Let's give her a big hand. Donna Lauren, ladies and gentlemen. Bobby Rydell and I were cast as regulars for the new Uncle Milty show on ABC. We would film live at the Hollywood Palace, a gorgeous Art Deco theater with an enormous stage. Memorable to me is a duet I did with Bobby in. We had three partial costume changes, beginning with portraying Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy, transitioning to Louis Prima and Keeley Smith, and then ending with Sonny and Cher. The fiasco of leaving home was peppered with ongoing trips for Dr. Pepper, accompanied by Maury still sharing a hotel room wherever I went. Travel with my dad and the Milton Berle show went on with true to form, Maury being pragmatic about the situation. As long as I was working, he was content not to badger me about my living situation. As in the case of Don Rickles on the beach party sets, I was spared any practical jokes or silly antics by Mr. Burle. I believe that I had a shadow image that everyone knew I was representing a corporation. Therefore, that spared me a lot of heartache. I did, however, see him treat a woman in a distressing way when he rehearsed a scene for one of our shows. 
An actress who would be playing a skit with him arrived on crutches and a cast on one foot. She explicitly asked him to take care during rehearsal and go easy on her physically. She would be going all out for the audience performance that would be televised. She said the wrong thing by trying to reason with him because during rehearsal, he threw her crutches aside and began tossing her around until she hit the floor. Not a damn thing intervened between his recklessness with the actress. She took this abuse. Another time, Eddie Fisher was on the show. Oh, what a voice. His voice was gorgeous. I loved it. By now, Eddie's marriage to Elizabeth Taylor was over, and he married Connie Stevens a few months after his appearance on this show. I would see Connie at a lot of events, and she had actually been on the Dr. Pepper celebrity party that I hosted <laughs> at the beginning of my contract. She was always very pleasant around me. Our dress rehearsals were filmed as a fail-safe prior to an actual live taping. Thank goodness, because during rehearsal, Eddie Fisher was sober. By the time we were ready for the real show, he was so plastered he could barely stand up. Therefore, to preserve his dignity, his extremely beautiful performance at dress rehearsal was edited into the live show. Oh, my goodness. I've often spoken to actors who performed on live television, whether it was in music shows in the 1960s or dramatic anthologies of the 1950s. And all sorts of things used to happen where, you know, with live TV, you you, you just had to go with it. In this case, you had a fail safe for Eddie Fisher, and it's very, um, I'm very glad that you did. Similar parallel, taking us back to Shindig, the same mm. thing happened when I cut... <laughs> One of the turtle's hair a little too short when I volunteered to um, trim his, his his long hair, and they had to use they had to use the dress rehearsal. <laughs> That's great, and uh, you know, speaking speaking of you know, what a voice, and of course, Eddie Fisher had a beautiful voice, but particularly in listening to some of Bobby Rydell's music in preparation for this, what a voice Bobby Rydell has got as well. Um, amazing. It's amazing. And still. Yeah, he still does. And and I think what our listeners are really going to enjoy is that when you listen to him even talking in the interview, that voice is just brilliant and is still brilliant. And I could listen to it all day. So <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I'm sure he'll be happy to know that. And yeah, he's he's a, just a really outgoing, friendly guy who loves people. And he just he just has that um, enthusiasm for life. So, mm. it's you know, that's what he projects. And so much of that generation, you know, him, you, um, Frankie, Fabian, all, all of those people, you know, often started quite young. I know Bobby Rydell started in, um, you know, on a talent show as well on TV, same as you did in, in local TV in, in Los Angeles. And so they're long careers of people who started quite, early on uh, from what I understand of Bobby he had a he had quite a supportive father I think who did support him as he was pursuing that young career but just reading some of his autobiography he had a, a conversely quite difficult relationship with his with one parent with his mother oh, another parallel yeah so it, it, it's an interesting uh, interesting story as, as many of these people that we've spoken about who, who do start at um, quite a young age and, and segue into a teenage career in the 60s as, as you did. And, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, you've spoken before about particularly enjoying these situations where you had a chance to be in a, a duet with someone. So whether it was Bobby Sherman on Shindig or Bobby Hatfield from the Righteous Brothers on Shindig, as well as Bobby Rydell, that you seem to really quite enjoy having that occasion when you could to sort of not just be a solo, but often to to do a duet with someone. Yeah, I like to sing with the Bobbies. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, they're all... <laughs> Coincidentally. Oh, the, the Bobbies were a... Where I, I, that was, I guess, a very popular name back then, in the <laughs> same way that the Johnnies and the Judies and. <laughs> I hope I hope they feel the same way about me. That's all I can say. <laughs> but it was it was delightful, and and mm. of course, Bobby and I had uh, Bobby Rydell and I had not met until mm. we were working together, and um, it was very natural. You know, I mean, um, there was a symbiosis as soon as we began uh, rehearsing and then when it came to the performance you know we just seemed to have a lot of fun together and 
um, you know, when work doesn't feel like work, that's mm. the greatest. And does it, um, you know, uh, I guess comparing, uh, you know, Shindy, which um, we've spoken about in, in terms of the filming before, but with the Mildred Bell show, from what you remember, was there a similar sort of schedule? Did you have enough time to be able to rehearse? Was it a relatively quick process? Um... Mm, uh, <laughs> I put you on the spot, haven't I, with that one? Because it was a relatively short show. It didn't, it didn't, unfortunately, it didn't last very long. So It lasted the, 13 weeks. Um, yeah. you, you know, in those days, that's, that's how they figured it. You know, mm. you've got 52 weeks a year. Um, a season is 13 weeks. And, you know, according to the ratings, uh, his format was probably a little dated. Yeah. And um, uh, maybe his skits were, uh, you know, maybe uh, also a little dated. Mm. But um, I think that the 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 guests the guests that he had on, um, you know, were fairly relevant. Just um, what can you say? You know, everybody has their time, and and some of us have longer, and others, you know, need to kind of uh, you know bite the bullet a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And and but, like you said, the guests were amazing. I mean, he had he had great guests, I guess, from his years of being on TV. Because he had been on he had been on obviously since the dawn of television. That's why he was Mr. TV. So he had a pretty impressive roster of of people who come on. Besides those that you had uh, mentioned in in the opening, um, it's very hard. It seems very hard to find any of these episodes. I know we we do have, you do have one on YouTube of your performance of of the song "Call Me," um, and uh, also a skit involving Adam West is, is circular on the on the net but they're very hard to find anything else but just looking at lists of the cast you know people like uh martha ray jane mansfield uh who else was there i think we mentioned phyllis diller bruce leave uh richard harris some of the more contemporaries as well you know paul revere and the raiders and peter and gordon and and um dm carroll was on it tony randall was on it so it looked like it had a good roster of guest stars but as you said perhaps the format by then had, had become quite dated Mm-hmm. Um, I really, you know, don't have a, a, a deep evaluation about that. I just mm-hmm. know that everything has its time. And uh, I think it was done really beautifully. And um, there is an association here that uh, has old television shows. And um, I don't I I don't know what the access is. I, I think uh, we tried to explore that a bit. And didn't get very far so um who knows at some point maybe they'll release them (laughs) Mm. since since the since the world is going through so many changes and you know many doors were locked and and uh for whatever reasons you know Mm. um things might open up you never know i i I, maybe i'll get a little bit more persuasive (laughs) absolutely you know i mean everything is going on streaming now and and um, I, I need to ask, because I've obviously only ever seen very small snippets of it, but was the show broadcast in black and white or colour? I know I know what's on, on line is in black and white, but do you remember if it was in colour? I, you know, you, you, now you're really catching me. <laughs> no, I don't. I really don't. I kind of, I, I, and I don't know. And maybe that's something, if anyone does know, please do write into us and, and let us know because regardless of that, you've got some, you know, brilliant colour photos from the set. Yeah, but... that's what's confusing me because, mm. I, I, you know, because Maury took photographs in colour and so now I'm confused. <laughs> I I, I've thrown it. We might have to ask Bobby Rydell next time we speak to him as well. But, um, yeah, because you've got those beautiful pictures of, of yourself and Bobby Rydell performing in those different costume changes. He has a cool story in the interview that we're going to have about one of those, which was Louis Prima, when you when he played Louis Prima and you played Keely Smith, that uh, he, he has a bit of a Louis Prima story that we will we'll preempt. But I guess describe that theatre for me, because that was a that was a beautiful theatre, wasn't it? The, the, it um, really is. Mm. And um yeah, it's it's directly. I think we spoke about this previously. It's directly across the street on Vine, above Hollywood Boulevard, um, from the Capitol Tower, and uh, it looks like you know kind of a gothicy style uh, building that's been there for probably like the old Hollywood days mm-hmm. and uh, been used who knows when I don't recall that would be another thing. If someone mm. is listening and knows the, the history of that particular building, um, it looks like it's maybe 
who knows, 100 years old, maybe maybe 90 to 100 years old, maybe even older. Could be, it could be dating back to uh, some of the original theatres there. It could be, absolutely, yeah. If anyone does ever have a chance to, to sort of walk past that, we, uh, I'm not quite sure what they use it for right now, but even that facade, the, the front of it is, is, you know, absolutely stunning. So it's, um, it's a very cool building. So that must have been a, a, a cool place to, um, to be able to film this show. Oh, yes. And the audience um, in in those times, they, of course, they turned it into a dance club at one point. So mm. um, when people are standing, you can probably pack up, you know, maybe 1500 people or so in there. But um, to seat an audience, you're still, t- you know, maybe a few hundred people, which keeps it intimate. Mm. And mm. Um, and that's always good. That was my experience on Shindig, you know, around 300 people in an audience is quite delightful especially when you have cameras and lighting and all of that coming between you and the audience um there's still a connection there it's not too big fantastic and and with uh, was that similar to some of the shows you did on the local scene where you know uh, lloyd thaxton or sam riddle or any of those other ones was that kind of the usual sort of audience size or did it vary the the, the dance party shows um mm. You know, mm. that were for promoting your record, including when Dick Clark moved out to the West Coast. Uh, basically, you had your dancers as your audience. Right. Yeah. Of and, course. you know, so you had um, I don't know, maybe 100 or 150 teenagers who um, were fairly regular. You know, mm. uh, they had they had their kind of place in in the lives of the audience that were watching them, you know, everyone had their favorite dancers. Yeah. So it was, it was um, more of a hmm, controlled situation, you know, with, with uh, less people, but a little bit more critical because they were exposed to a lot of um, music and, and, Mm -hmm. um, and if they, you know, if it didn't move them, you're in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) If it literally, literally didn't move them, you were in trouble. I hadn't actually thought of that, you know, (laughs) It reminds me of when you spoke about a, a few episodes or quite a few episodes ago, I guess, at this point, because we've, we've done quite a few, but about the Dick Stewart show in San Francisco and the regular dancers on that. You know, we spoke about one of them, Tiger, but they were often the, the local kids who would, who would you know, be part of the show, of, of come up to come into the show as, as dancers and um, yeah. were probably as big a part because they were a regular part of those shows, whereas, you know, the guests, the guests came in and did their latest record, but they were the probably the that a lot of the local uh uh watchers of of that those tv shows um engaged with yeah they became yeah did you have anything like that where you're from well we had our own and i'm trying to trying to remember the australian sort of history but there were shows like we had a bandstand um which i think bobby rydell actually appeared on because he was here so often that i'm sure he did one if not multiple appearances on on the australian version of bandstand but we also had a show that was a probably almost kind of like a shindig type show which was called the go show and and so there were those sorts of music shows over here but there would have also been a lot of the um, sort of live television because local tv was so so big so whether it was music or variety or, or whatever else um you know yeah. I, I think there are uh, those those performers and those people became very much a part of people's people's lives and yeah. um, you know i think just to you know you, you sort of raise this point about mildred bell's you know treatment of, of one of the cast members or one of the guests women on the show and i i think that is important to raise because you know we've we've so much changing i guess in the world and people speaking out and so on and, and we're not i'm i'm not sort of paralleling it necessarily with a lot of the the conversation at the moment but there does seem to be um and i'm interested in your perspective on this is this idea that often you know people in positions of power people not just in the entertainment industry but this is what we're talking about this idea i think that they could treat people however the hell they wanted and there wouldn't be a repercussion of it um you know, I think it's interesting to hear that story about how he treated that 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 guest star on that appearance. Yeah, and that's kind of what's hopefully changing on this planet is, you know, the the idea that anyone can dominate anyone and that anyone is better. You know, I mean, we're all equal, and you know, and that has been forgotten for way too long. Um, and hopefully whatever's going on between the virus and politics and racism and anything that causes a separation uh, between 
you know, humans and, and all life on planet earth, you know, it's just, it, it has not worked. It, you know, war is not the answer and competition is not the answer. Mm. It's, you know, it's appreciation and respect and whatever, whatever behavior and you as a psychologist would know this much better than I, but just as a layman, um, the, the treatment of anyone and coming from that place of, I have to keep going back to ego Mm. where the mind, you know, where the Mm. mind is taking over, uh, the decisions of the heart and Mm. the heart is so universal that getting back to the idea of any sort of domination and separation, um, you know, that's just, that's, I, I just have to see it as the past. Mm. And, and even, even whatever behavior I personally have done, that is a reflection of that energy, because we're all, you know, captured in that energy field and it so some of us even though we we would prefer coming from our heart you know pop back into our heads Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and, um and think that we're the power Mm -hmm. when we're not we're not the power (laughs) sorry you know we need to listen to uh, the 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 superpower you know (laughs) (laughs) this the supreme power that the force that that's that's um created life for all of us Mm. and uh whatever you want to call that it has nothing to do for me with religion it's it's just kind of what is my goodness i mean there's so much diversification in life you know when you think about it Mm. you know the creatures Mm. that have survived for hundreds of millions of years and and um and and you just look at the mountains and you you just look at life and you see there's so much similarity and, you know, where we came from. And but then there's this ego thing, you know, mm. started, started taking over. And whenever that happened, which is such a curiosity for me, you know, that all of a sudden someone drew a line in the sand and said, if you cross over, you know, you owe me. And whenever that took place thousands and thousands of years ago is when the ego took over and we've we've been in this you know warlike state ever since mm. gender wise etc and i'm just hoping that there's more consistency of coming from the heart and you know taking the mind and yes making rational decisions making wise choices but connecting you know with the infinite you know mm. looking up and just admiring you know, it's like the infinite space out there and, and where, where we might have all come from, for goodness sake. And, mm. Um, mm. and then think about a, a guy like, a, you know, a Milton Berle, who um, <laughs> has some kind of uh, attitude, you know, or, or um, you know, belligerence or maybe, you know, mother issues or whatever it was that goes into gender inequality. And, you know, and we're just not living in that time anymore. Yes. You know, yes. There's a new consciousness. I think that's so spot on that, of course, there's that difficulty in, in looking at some of, you know, people watch old TV shows and go, well, we have to realise it was of a time. But, and that's fine, I guess. But we're not in those times anymore. And, and that's why we need to move forward. And I think that's exciting. I, I know sometimes people get resistant or, or scared of that, perhaps, or, or whatever else and push back. But it should be exciting moving towards this where not only are we no longer as much as possible taking this dominance that some people people have over other people but also learning more about ourselves and I'm probably speaking a bit about myself at the moment this idea of of people pleasing or that when you're people a people pleaser you do tend to allow a lot of this to to happen or at least I found that to be my own experience and and I find it really interesting what you talk about this idea of the dominance I guess of our species over over others and that missing connection but between us I was listening to Alan Alder's podcast the other day which is a 
you know, brilliant conversations that he has with people. But they were talking about the lungfish and how closely related we are to the lungfish and, you know, this <laughs> idea. And, and I, I didn't know that I'm not good at that kind of stuff, but they were talking about voice and the idea of, of voice and this idea of how the lungfish, you know, in, in evolving developed um, what's a, akin to us in some way. Um, but, um, you know, this idea of connection, I think uh, perhaps the virus, as we've spoken about before, is making us be a bit more acutely aware of our connection to other humans as well as our connection to the natural environment. Thank goodness. Mm, mm, Really, I'm so sorry that it had to come to this, but something had to wake us up, not just to unite as a humanity, but also to our gorgeous, beautiful, living organism that we are all dependent upon. And the interdependence, rather than the, you know, codependency or um, anything that has to do with low self-esteem. And I I just want to make a one comment mm. about what you said about people pleasing. And basically what you were uh, alluding to is that, you know, you tend to give more. And, uh, you know, so when there's that kind of inequality, you know, you, you're in a sacrificial situation, you know, always feeling like you give more than you're receiving. And, um, you know, there's like the short end of the stick. Mm. Well, let's face it, Adam, and everyone who's listening, that the blessing of coming into this lifetime in an environment where you are accepted and, you know, the obstacles that are thrown our way of having to hurdle over, you know, any kind of attitude that you are less than and, um, and we all come in in love and we all go out in love and Mm, and mm. and that's that's the real cycle and um and that hopefully as i keep experiencing in my own little world the children the babies that are that are coming in in my purview is you know these little little ones are being treated at least, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be too overly general, but the ones that I see have so much wisdom, have mm. so much awareness. And I swear, I, I always say to the parents, you know, I think they know more than we do. <laughs> and you know what? And the parents have the kind of respect for these little ones to admit, oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's a. And and so they should, or we hope that for the development and the and the continued development of us as humans, that you know we would hope that we keep evolving in that way. Um, but remember, yeah. re- remember, just in many, many, too many people's experience, and and all kinds of you know creatures in this lifetime. Some of us are blessed with acceptance and you know excitement and. Um, affection and love and uh, and the ability to be listened to from the beginning Mm, mm. Um, and and when those obstacles start coming you know and you start hurtling those obstacles is when you find ways of 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 creating a survival mechanism Mm. and when you speak about you know sacrificing to be a people pleaser as a as a layman um, without the terminology (laughs) you know um, y- yes, you, you feel like there's something lacking. And so you have to overcompensate when the truth of it is we are all the same. We are all equal. And the more I'm going to use a word that may, may or may not be perceived the way that I intend, but Uh-oh. Oh dear. <laughs> well, androgyny, uh. androgyny, you know, when you think about it, I know that we're all so much into identity of feminine or masculine or the, the, the identity of taking a little bit of a higher point of view mm. 
of, of we are all the same when you come right down to it. We all thank God come in with a heart. Most of us, at least with a healthy heart, let's hope, you know, when you start thinking about it and okay, you have a different organism than me. I have it. Okay. That makes me a little unique. Okay. We're all a little unique. We're all a little extraordinary, but we're all the same. Mm. And I think that's so important at the moment when there's so much division and there's so much of this, um, you know, well, you can't be, you can't be that person. I understand the world this way. I understand that people are this or this, and there's, it's just so restricting and it doesn't help anyone. Um, and I think, yeah, th- it is changing, but it, and it needs to change. And so, so my advice should... is to listen with your heart, mm. listen mm. with your heart as you would want someone to listen to you. Just start listening to them. Absolutely. And I think that leads in very well to our interview because I know Bobby Rydell talks about, particularly during, you know, COVID and and the idea of who, uh, you know, being, I guess, at home as many people are. But, you know, he talks about the importance of friends. He talks about his children. Um, In the end, that's, I think, what it all comes down to. And I think many people are, thankfully, and I think we all are hopefully becoming more aware of of what's what is important. I was speaking to someone just briefly, um, you know, the other day about this idea of of pursuing happiness, and you know, is that is that a problematic idea because it almost implies that you're pursuing something outside mm-hmm. of yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that he was so on the money when he said that. And you know, I I think it's about you know. Pursuing stuff is, of course, important, but there's also relationships and meaning and the relationship that you have with yourself. Discovering that the happiness is there mm. and whatever is covering it up, you know, take it off. <laughs> take it off. <laughs> it is winter Be, here. Be, I, really, <laughs> just connect, connect and your blessings will come surrender and your blessings will come and i'm mm-hmm. and if you choose to surrender to jesus or buddha or muhammad or what whomever whatever you want to call it you know that that's language and that's mm-hmm. that's it but if it's a connection with your heart to the beyond that's that's to me the path Absolutely. And I was going to get a bit a bit silly and say, well, it's winter at the moment. I'm not taking a, anything off. It is freezing <laughs> in Australia right now. Excuse me. The day of winter. But, but no, I get, I get your point. It wasn't about that. You can turn the thermostat up and still take it off. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> Put another log on the fire. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, uh, that would be lovely. But it's Well, been, let's go listen hmm, to Bobby, huh? Please. I was going to say, we've, we've had such an interesting, well, I hope it was interesting, and I'm sure our listeners, please do let us know at podcast at donnalloran.net uh, what you think of this show or any of the other shows and any questions you have. You know, we always enjoy speaking about uh, listener questions because it can often get us both to think about things that we haven't considered before so with that thank you for listening again and uh, now we're going to go over to Donna's reunion and conversation with Mr Bobby Rydell Bobby Rydell, welcome to you, a man with a heart of gold and a new lease on life, including two vital organs and your wife, Linda. Well, I think I was about 19 years old. You were in your early 20s when we were cast together on the Milton Berle show. Oh, yeah, remember that? On the stage of the Hollywood Palace. Yeah, re- remember the skit that we did, Donna? <laughs> right across the street from Capitol Records, another thing we have in common. Yeah, remember? but do you remember the skit that we did? Absolutely. 
absolutely, yeah, they, absolutely. Louis Fema and Kelly Smith, remember? <laughs> I do, I do. I recall that when yeah. when we, we started out, we had three uh, bits to do, and um, we started out with Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. <laughs> oh God, I got sir. I even forgot that. My yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to you want to do a little. I am calling you. <laughs> I put on a curly blonde wig and you know, yeah. a, a kind of the uh, Canadian mountain. Yeah, the mountaineer. Yeah, the mountaineer thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. I I got a uh, a telegram uh, from Louis Prima. Oh my! And he was he got really mad about the skit that we did. What? I don't. I, I yeah. I don't know why. He said, Bobby, uh, you know, man, I thought everything would be between us was cool, you know, this, that, the other thing. He may have had one too many martinis at the moment. <laughs> That's very possible, yeah. Doesn't bring out the best in you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> correct. <laughs> but remember, so I remember the uh, the lineup was starting with uh, with Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald. Then we moved into the short black wig and, and oh Nancy, yeah, yeah, That's that right. was Keely Smith and Louis Prima. And Louis Prima, right, right. Then we graduated to a furry vest and a long wig for two wigs for I've Got You, Babe, with Sunny. Oh, Michelle. Sunny, that's right. Oh, gee, wow. You know, I even forgot. All I remembered was the Louis Prima, Kaylee Smith thing. Yeah. Gee, now that you reminded me, yeah, Jeanette McDonald, oh, my God. Yes. Sunny yes. and Cher. Yes, and, of course, Milton Berle, I, I should ask you uh, <laughs> about your memories, uh, you know, other than, the, what we did together, but you know, you had some other experiences on the Milton Burl show when you did that, right? Well, you know, I traveled around with uh, with Milton uh, to promote the show, and we went, you know, to different cities. And uh, let me see, yeah, I was on Capitol at the time, and Milton had wrote a song, oh. which became which became the theme song of the show called "You Gotta Enjoy Joy." Okay. And, yeah, yeah, and it's it's a great. I don't know if you ever go to YouTube, uh, you can uh, listen to the recording of it. Uh, uh, it's a big band arrangement. It's a swing thing, and it's it, it's it lyrically it's great, and and uh, and 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 far as uh, uh, vocally, it's it's a marvelous it's a marvelous tune. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was uh, one of, one of the things I really enjoyed doing uh, on Capitol. I mean, it was big band. We had like four trumpets, four bones, five reeds, piano, bass, drums, rhythm, guitar, and on on, on playing drums on the date was Louis Nelson. Oh my! And, yeah, and the the song started off like pap pap pa da boom boom pa da 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 da. So anyway, we get to the top of the thing. And it starts off, well, you got to win joy, joy. you got to love, love. And Louie was playing on top of the uh, the ride cymbal. So I went over, after one you know, after one take, I went over to, to Louie Belson. I said, excuse me, Mr. Belson. I said, but can you play that first verse on a, on a, on a closed hi-hat? Oh. You know. And he said, is that what you want, Bobby? I said, well, if you don't mind, uh, Louie. He said, yeah, man, I'll do that. <laughs> I'm telling Louie Belson what the hell to play, you know. Well, if you hear it, of course you're going to communicate it. You know, you've got that in your head. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, to sing for the first time on television our theme song, you got to enjoy joy, Bobby Rydell. You gotta enjoy joy, you gotta love love, you gotta put frown down and give it a show. The world is a groovy, mad, mad movie, 
As long as you swing, you're king. And life's a ring-a-ding thing. You gotta dig fun, son. Start having a ball. You'll build your morale, pal. A thousand feet tall. It's great to be living, laughing, loving. You gotta have go, go. You gotta fly sky high. You gotta enjoy joy. Gotta enjoy joy. You gotta love love. You gotta put crown down and the game of the show. The world is a groovy mad man movie. As long as you swing, you're king. And life's a ring a ding thing. You gotta take fun, son. Start having a ball. You'll build your morale, pal, a thousand feet tall. It's great to be living, loving, loving. You gotta have go, go. You gotta fly sky high. You gotta enjoy joy. You gotta love love. You gotta have a go, go, go. And you gotta fly sky high. Thanks very much for doing my song. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Away, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back with Martha Ray, James Mansfield, Jimmy Brown, Peter and Gordon. How do you do this? Well, I, I've been playing drums since I was five years old. My father took me to see the Benny Goodman band, and he was playing drums for Benny Goodman. It was Gene Krupa. Oh, for goodness, yeah. So I said to my yeah, I said to my father, I don't know who that guy is playing drums, Daddy, but I want to be him. And I've been playing drums since five years old. Oh, and do you have a kit set up? Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, well, that is another thing that we have in common. My son... Um, when he was, his, my son Joey, when he was six months old, and he could sit up, you know, hold his back up straight, um, I had a professional set of bongos in the house, and he started playing them. And um, and he basically, uh, just before this whole thing started, you know, with Corona, just got off tour with Roger Waters as the drummer for him. How about that? Isn't that, How old is he now? Well, my son is 51. Oh my god. Wow. So yes. is my so is my son. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, we, you know, we have the same roots. And yeah, really. My son, my daughter, I have five grandchildren and it's oh, wonderful. Right. Yeah, oh, it's right. absolutely wonderful. That's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. And are they all like close in the neighborhood or well, they live they live in New Jersey. We're in Pennsylvania. They're in New Jersey, and they're only about driving time forty five minutes, so it's no oh, big deal. Yeah. And my daughter, yeah. That's the perfect distance, right? They absolutely. Think. And my daughter and my son, they live a mile apart. <laughs> I'm no poor little fool, I'm a man. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm a man. Don't forget that I'm a man. When a girl changes from body size to heart, then she's old enough to give her heart. 
Those last three young fellows, of course, were all from Philadelphia, and back in the early days, they were regular visitors on American Bandstand, and uh, I guess they had a pretty good time because recently they got together again and toured the country as the Golden Boys of Bandstand. Makes me feel good, like the good old days. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friends Frankie Avalon, Fabian, and Bobby Rydell. Frankie, lead off. And well, besides drums, though, am I incorrect? Um, did you play trumpet as well? No, Frankie did. Frankie Avalon played oh, trumpet. Okay, okay. Yeah, Frank. That's that's how I, I I I've known Frankie. Let me see. Uh, since ten years old. Oh and my goodness. Frank, Frankie's two years older than me. He oh, and uh, yeah, he. Uh, let me see. I'm seventy eight now. Frankie's eighty, and we go back. We go back forever. You know, mm-hmm. before either one of us, you know, got into the recording end of it. You know. That's so beautiful. Yeah, and we've been friends for lo and behold, you know, since ten years old. Well, and then what is it in the mid eighties? Then you became the Golden Boys. Oh, yeah. Uh, my manager at the time, his name was Dick Fox. He had this idea to put three Italian kids from South Philadelphia, <laughs> you know, to teenage idols, and we all talked to one another. I talked to Fabe, Fabe talked to Frank, Sandra Zippa, and we said, hey, man, it sounds like fun. So we started the show back in 1985, and it was a tremendous success, Donna, a tremendous success. And... I said to Frank, uh, you know what, Frank, you know, I call him Cheech in Italian, Frank Cheech. All right. Yeah, I said, you know what, Cheech, I said, this is great, man. You know, it's a lot of fun, but how long is this going to last? A year, two years, tops, and it's over. Okay, now we're, we're, we're already booked into 2021. So we've been doing the show, you know, close to, what, 30, 35 years. It's, it's amazing, and it's a lot of fun. I have to ask you, uh, you know, very interesting how uh, you know your audience? Um, is it is it more our generation or our absolutely, generation? absolutely. Okay. Uh, my, well, I, but there's younger kids because their parents, you know, or grandparents take them to see us because they remember our music, you know. And sometimes, you know, uh, whatever different venue we're at, we have to hold, you know, for. 10, 15, 20 minutes, because a lot of our people are walking in with, you know, crutches and wheelchairs. Oh, dear. <laughs> so you're on the drums on the on the closed hi-hat going, shh. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes when we pull into town, you know, the marquee reads uh, Dick Fox's Golden Boys, but sometimes the G falls off and it's Dick Fox's Olden Boys. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I would consider you ageless, Bobby. But <laughs> oh, thank you, sweetheart. The energy that's coming from you is just absolutely fabulous. And I'm sure all of the people in the audience are just totally rejuvenated and filled with so much joy. Well, you know, Donna, that's the way it is. You know, our, our particular era was a great era. You know, it'll never come back again, but, you know, the, the, the memories, the fond memories, you know, of the late 50s and early 60s was such a wonderful time. And, and that's what we do on the show. We're not out there trying to prove anything. We're just up there having fun, you know, and the audience you know, the audience falls in love with it. Mm, mm, mm. So that, to me, leads me to my question of what is your secret weapon? And I, it seems like the answer is built in. <laughs> well, my secret weapon is I have a nail clipper that I love. <laughs> oh, that's right. yeah. I trim my nails, you know. You know, I, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a nice nail clipper. I love it. That's my secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you, your fun is your secret weapon, and absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when I'm home, uh, which I've been home a lot now, you know. <laughs> Because a lot of, you know, engagements have been either canceled or postponed and so on and so forth. But uh, now that we're you know, we're just kind of confined to uh, um, no eating, you know, at the restaurants, no eating inside. But every Wednesday night, when possible, me and like 10 other guys, we're all Italian, and we go out and we have dinner at an Italian restaurant, and we have a ball. 
we, oh. it, yeah, it's just a lot of fun, you know. I think the cook put something in your uh, marinara to keep all the the bad juju away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I think some Chianti as well. <laughs> oh, you know, absolutely. We have to have some Chianti. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I want to thank. Dr. Adam, my collaborator on this podcast, for arranging this interview, and your darling wife, Linda. And um, I just wish you all the best. And will you tell us again when you are launching, relaunching your Golden Boys in 2021? Uh, I think we start in April. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we start in April. And we have quite a few engagements lined up. You know, we're, we're, we're doing Florida. We do a place called in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It used to be called, uh, I think it was called the Sands. It changed names. We're in Atlantic City. Uh, we're in uh, Boston. Uh, you know, a lot of things coming up. And hopefully, you know, they don't cancel or postpone them. Well, we'll see. We, we'll see how the world, you know, respects um, Madam Corona. For for what she is serving us, you know, and and uh, and hopefully it's you know ultimately a positive message. And I positive. certainly I certainly hope so, Donna. Really, you know, yeah. it gets to the point where you know uh, Anthony Newley. When I went to see him the first time in in uh, in, in London, and the show was called "Stop the World, I Want to Get Off." Oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so we got to stop this world the way it's happening now because we all got to get off of this stuff. Yes, yes. Well, you know, we're slowing down. It's like that, that Paul Simon song, you know. Yeah. Slow down, you move too fast. Fast, boom, boom. Gotta make it more. Looking for fun. And feeling groovy. <laughs> God bless you, darling. Thank you ever so much, Donna, and I certainly hope we get the chance to see one another again in the very near future. It'll be great seeing you again. It's been too been been way too long. Thank you, darling. Cheek to cheek. Lots cheek to of long, cheek. Long distance hugs and kisses. You got it. (laughs) Sending you lots of love. Thank you ever so much, sweetheart. God bless the world. God bless the world is right. Yes, love.